live right here on the Street Hype Entertainment Show once again. Tuned in. Uh, we at uh, Newport News and Mahogany Styles, right? That's where we at today, you know what I'm saying? Doing the Street Hype interview with Dr. Umar Johnson, man. We've been to this now about two days now, rolling around with you. It's still a lovely event early in the day. We got your lovely book out. Yes, sir. Um, kind of let us know more about your book this round. I guess what? Right, all right. This is what we're going to kind of talk about this Well, the book is entitled The Psychoacademic Holocaust, right. Special Education and ADHD Wars Against Black Boys. Right. And basically what I'm trying to do in this book is educate our parents and uh, other members of the community who work with African-American boys about the various strategies and traps and tactics that are being used by the American social order by way of public school as well as the psychological evaluation to marginalize and oppress our young men through the mental disorder diagnosis. So whether we're talking about special ed, which is the learning disability, or the mild mental retardation, or the emotional disturbance, or whether we're talking about the ADHD, or the conduct disorder, or the opposition of the fine disorder, too many African American boys are being diagnosed with mental illnesses that they don't have, so they can be separated from the regular classroom and given an inferior education, or so that they can be medicated with dangerous mind-altering side effects, drugs that come with dangerous side effects, so that they can control their behavior chemically, since they're not really meeting their needs uh, psychologically and mentally. Young dope heads, so to speak. Young dope heads, kitty that's crack. That's good, kitty crack, that's what you said earlier. Now, what inspired you to write the book? You just feel like the book out of bed one morning and there's something in your heart already. Oh, uh, you know what? What's your Honestly, I'm 38 now. This book should have been written like 15 years ago, man. I was supposed to write my first book coming out of high school or undergrad. Mm -hmm. I just thank God I finally got a chance to finish it. Uh, I got my doctorate this past summer, so I said I need to get the book done now, right? you know, because uh, I've been seeing some people kind of take some of my concepts and ideas and kind of uh, snatch my intellectual property away a little bit. Mm. So I said I need to hurry up and write a book out before all my stuff ends up in somebody else's book. Right, you know, get a final stamp on yeah, it. Yeah, yes, indeed. Right. But the primary motive for the book was to make sure that our parents had something in their hands that they can open up whenever they had a problem. They want my son tested for ADHD. You can read in my book what to do about that. Okay. okay. The psychiatrist want to prescribe my son a certain drug. Well, I got a whole chart in here with the psychiatric drugs that they give and the side effects. And there's a lot of children getting diagnosed with that in my hometown, that A-H-A-D-D thing. Yes. And that's because of uh, fatherless. Fatherless. Most of the black child has a specific learning disability. How do we know that the child is really learning disabled? Simply, the child might be a child who learns differently. And then what is the fourth man-made disability? The ADHD, or ain't no daddy at home disorder, as I like to call it. Because that's all it is, is ain't no daddy at home disorder. There was no ADHD around before there was a war on black males, black men, which began taking place in the 1970s. That's when you see ADHD explode. In fact, we don't get ADHD until 1980, I believe. Why is that interesting? Because 1980 is the same year that the CIA dropped crack cocaine off in the black community. So what is my point? They started drugging the boys and drugging the men at the exact same time. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand that a psychiatric war is a psychiatric war. Whether we're talking about opium and crack and heroin on the street, or whether we're talking about Ritalin, Concerta, and Adderall in the school. Brain drugs are brain drugs, and they are all the same with different labels on them. In fact, when you study the history of drugs in America, you'll find that most of the illegal drugs now that are being used to send black men to prison were once legal. Every drug was once legal. Cocaine was once legal. Opium was once legal. Heroin was once legal. And when you do your research on the psychiatric drug complex, you'll find that many of the companies that manufacture the drugs that we give our children are also mayor players in the illegal drug trade. In fact, Take a look at it in your hometown. Oh, yeah, you see that right. nearly all of them are single parent mother. Oh, and it's not the mother's fault. It's just that they need their fathers. But the government is locking their fathers up and then putting drugs in the son's mouth so that they can behave while their father is away. Okay? Give him his father back and we don't need any more drugs. And what makes it so hypocritical is you send a black man to jail for a mandatory five or ten years, depending on the amount of drugs he had on him, but then you give his son the same drug with a different name on it, so he can sit still long enough to be miseducated. Mm. You locked my father up for selling drugs and then got a nerve to give me the drugs that you locked him up 
get us some of the, the illegal drugs. Exactly. You got you, got exactly. you. Now, the another thing I see that you talk about is pan activism. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I was kind of introduced in, um, uh, in the movement uh, Van Deli down in Texas. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, rest in peace there, brother. You know what I'm saying? Uh, tell us more about that. You say you was uh, uncle, uh, nephew of Frederick, Frederick Douglass. Douglass. Great, 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 great grand That's nephew of Frederick Douglass. Now, Frederick Douglass, he experimented with Pan Africanism early on in his career. Right. He even once considered Haiti as a possible re repatriation island for Africans in America because at one point in his career, he didn't think it was possible for Africans to ever be accepted as citizens in this country. And he modified his position a little bit later in life, but I'm not too sure he believed it even then. Because when you read some of Douglas's late speeches, he kind of alludes to the fact that America would never be willing to accept the African on equal terms and on equal footing. And I think Frederick Douglass's thought was influenced by the grandfathers of Pan-Africanism, <laughs> most of which grew up around him and were his adversaries and compatriots. For example, there were five major uh, grandfathers of Pan-Africanism. Uh, there was John Brown Rustworm, who's before Frederick Douglass' time a little bit. He was the first black man to get a college degree in America. He started the first black newspaper in America, Freedom's Journal. He then repatriated to Africa, to Liberia, where he's buried. I tried to go to his gravesite when I was there, but it was on the other side of the country to get there. Okay, then you have Martin Delaney, who co-edited the North Star newspaper with Frederick Douglass. He was a Pan-Africanist who believed that our only hope was repatriation to Africa. Alexander Crummel, another camp uh, patriot of Frederick Douglass. He built the American Negro Academy in 1897, one of the first institutions of higher learning for black men. He was W.E.B. Du Bois' first teacher. Mm -hmm. You add to that, uh, who else do we have? Uh, Bishop Henry, McNeil, Henry Holland Garnett, who actually debated Frederick Douglass at a convention for Negro men over whether or not we should fight legally to eliminate slavery, or whether we should simply arm enslaved Africans with weapons so they could fight for their own freedom. Mm -hmm. He was the first black uh, pastor to give a speech on the floor of the United States Congress. Mm. Martin Delaney was the first uniformed officer in the Civil War. So not only were these men grandfathers of Pan-Africanism, they are significant in our history for other things that they accomplished in their lives, but you don't even hear about them. What is this time frame, right? 1800s, 1900s? This is the 1830s to the 1880s. That's a little bit before Marcus Garvey, eh? Yes, Marcus Garvey was born 1887. So Marcus Garvey mm. is actually a child of Pan-Africanism. Oh, okay. So when we say Garveyism, Garveyism is not a new philosophy. Okay. Marcus Garvey did not create Garveyism. Mm. It existed before him. Oh, did? And sometimes my Garveyite brothers and sisters get upset for me for saying this, but there's Explain nothing that. Marcus Garvey taught that wasn't taught before Marcus Garvey was born. Gotcha. Now, I'm a Garveyite, okay, because I believe that Marcus Garvey's example was the greatest that we've had. Mm. And from Marcus Garvey, you get every other movement. Elijah Poole was a Garveyite. After Marcus Garvey gets the port, he changes his name to Elijah Muhammad. He starts the Nation of Islam. Uh, the early followers of the Rastafari, the founders of the Rastafari movement, Rastafari movement, my good brothers, they were members of the Garvey movement. The black Hebrews, uh, uh, Rabbi J. Arnold Ford, he was a Garveyite. Uh, even if you look at the more science temples, they were a year prior to the UNIA's creation, but their heyday didn't come until Marcus Garvey's deportation because they were able to benefit from the influx of all that Garveyite energy into the more Science Temples of America. So nearly all of our great movements can be traced back to Garvey. Garvey wasn't the first to put ships on the water and take people back to Africa. We already had that. Garvey didn't even create the phrase Africa for the Africans. That was Martin Delaney. He simply added to it Africans, Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad. But what makes Marcus Garvey unique is that he was the first Pan-African, Pan-Africanist, to give Pan-Africanism a significant movement, a mass movement. It never had a mass movement until Garvey. And that's why Garvey sparked like a nice flame yes. for him. And Marcus Garvey was the Michael Jordan of Pan-Africanism. Say what? Yeah, right. Michael Jordan did not invent basketball. But he elevated. Oh, right. Well, Marcus hey, man, Garvey did not yeah. invent Pan Africanism, yeah. but he elevated. Gosh. Now, now let me see. What I had, had to write down my questions no, this bro. time, fam. Um, let me see. Uh, uh, hey, everyone. Uh, being a young doctor, 
what are some of the, uh, you know, the, some of the uh, challenges you face or the elders in the business? Wow. Um, what I find with the elders, most elders are supportive, and I love them, but they can also be very jealous. Right. When a young man comes on the scene, sometimes it can be difficult for an older man to relinquish his position to the younger man and give him an opportunity to lead because he doesn't really feel accomplished himself. Mm. And so many of our elders will hold on to leadership positions even when they're past their prime because of egotistical reasons. Right. They're so used to being in the limelight, being in control, they don't want to give that up. Even if giving it up is in the best interest of the community. Mm. Also, they can direct jealousy at younger brothers because they are afraid that the younger brother's accomplishments might surpass theirs. So they attempt to sabotage your ability to help your people to prevent your accomplishments from surpassing yours. All of this is born of selfishness, but it's a reality. I always say, why is there a church on every other corner? That's right. The reason there's a church on every other corner is because in the liquor store. Well, the reason why there's a church in every other corner is because when a young brother comes out of seminary school, he wants to be a preacher. But the elder bishop or pastor don't want to share the microphone. She won't give him no Sunday sermons. He say, this is my church. You got to wait your turn. But the young brother says, I know it's your church, but I'm ready to lead. I'm ready to speak. I want to do my thing a little bit. There's no room for the young brother because the elder is so egotistical and such a control freak that he don't want nobody to give a sermon to his church but him, which means what? The young brother has to do what? Deflect out of the church, go and start his own church in order to be able to give his sermons. Or maybe even discouraged. Or maybe even get discouraged and walk away altogether. Right, the right. elders do not make room for nor pave the way for the youth. You do not see it. Look at all our national black organizations. None of them are grooming a successor. None of them. Al Sharpton ain't grooming a successor. Mr. Farrakhan ain't grooming a successor. Jesse Jackson ain't grooming a successor. Look at all the black leaders. None of them have a training program for the next generation mm. because they don't want to accept the fact that you are not going to be able to lead forever. I like that that fact that you was talking about on the schools. And we're going to get on that for a second. Um, so I had an is issue with my soulmanship. And uh, one of the things that you mentioned was, I know in our town, we have to give kids three different chances. I think one of them is like a three-day there's a five day, or maybe a ten day, and then they give you 365 days. Then when they give you the 365 days of suspension, I remember you saying, well, they have to give you some help, man. So what they do then, they have these alternative schools that I was talking to you yesterday. Well, prison companies, most of them. Mm, you know that, okay. There we go. So then um, I was telling you that that's made like GED program. Remember I was telling you yesterday, they mainly uh, focus on the GED program. Exactly. And they got uh, over 80% they saying ratio special ed equivalent, so to speak, of our children. Um, you said it's against the law. Let me make sure I heard that correctly. About maximum of 10 days. 10 days. If you want the child to be suspended more than 10 days, you can only recommend to the local school board that the child be suspended for 11 days or more. A school principal anywhere in the United States of America cannot suspend a child more than 10 days at a time. Any suspension of 11 days or more is an expulsion and can only be done after a due process hearing has been held with the parent present to be given an opportunity to argue against the suspension of their child. You cannot suspend without a hearing in front of the local school board for more than 10 days. Now, and I'll, because uh, I had it happen to me, so you know, I'm up here on 6 o'clock and everything upset about this matter, you understand? <laughs> so, but the superintendent wouldn't see me and I was proud of the rules. Okay. I'm written in everything in writing and stuff like that. So you saying, for parents who else may go through that. Um, you do everything right. That was a very good point you said. Uh, now, a brother like me, I did everything right. Okay. Um, but yet, still, like I said, the superintendent that was part of the rules with the same. Okay. And they gave my son 365, but they put him in the alternative school. What do you have to kind of say about that type of system? The reason they put him in the alternative school, remember how I said earlier, if can principals and teachers expel students? No. Who has the only authority to expel a child? Local school board. If it's a charter school, board of directors for the charter. 
As a principal, I can't expel. All I can do is what, y'all? Recommend to the school board that they expel Umar Johnson. But I can't expel Umar Johnson. I only have recommendation power. And if your child is ever brought up for expulsion, it's not over. There's two types of expulsion. Permanent, temporary. You know what permanent means, right? He ain't allowed to ever attend another school in this district so long as he lives. Now, why would a school district want to deny a child an education for the rest of their childhood is ridiculous to me. To me, that's a crime. I can't understand what a child can do that would make me say he don't get an education. But if your child is permanently expelled from school, I need you to know that the school district still has a responsibility to help you find a program that allows that child to still earn their diploma within a reasonable amount of time with their peers. So even when they kick you out of the Newport News School District, they still got to help him get his diploma. Now, by definition, an expulsion is what? Any removal of a child for more than 10 days. As a principal, I can suspend your child for a maximum of what? 10. If you ever get an 11-day suspension coming from the principal, that is illegal. The only person who can give you an 11-day suspension is the local school board. So if I want your son suspended for 20 days, you know what I have to do? I have to recommend to the school board that he be expelled for 20 days. You and your child come down to the school board hearing. We tell you why we want him out of the school for 20 days, because he beat up some girl, God forbid. And at the end of 20 days, he can come back to school. That's a temporary expulsion. And expulsion is nothing more than removal for more than 10. Now, if your child is ever brought up for expulsion, did you know that you have a right to review the evidence against your child, you have a right to cross-examine the witnesses. Did you know that? You can ask the teacher. How do you know it was my son? You got a right to ask questions. You have a right to bring an attorney, which can help significantly, because when the lawyers show up, they tend to back off. But I give you a better strategy. You know what I would do? Somebody want to expel one of my daughters? I'm going to call my state rep for Newport News, and I'm going to call my state senator in Newport News. And I'm going to say, excuse me, sir, this is Umar Johnson. I live here in Newport News. My son goes to the public school down the street. He's being brought up for expulsion. The reason I'm calling you is because I know education is a function of the state. The state runs education. And you a state rep, you a state senator. I voted for you. Even though I didn't, he don't know that. <laughs> I'm being real with you. I, didn't, I can't stand his guts, but he can't prove that. I voted for you, sir. They trying to kick my kid out. I voted for you the past three elections. I want you to do something about that. My son ain't got no right being kicked out of that school. I need you to get on it. We'll call you back tomorrow. And if you were firm with that state rep, guess what? You're going to get a phone call saying your child can go back to school tomorrow. They called that principal up and said, guess what? You're not doing it tomorrow because that's a vote that I need. Leave that boy alone. <laughs> I'll tell you how it goes. It works. It works. But you can't call them being nice. Um, uh, hello. This is Umar. How are you doing there, state rep? I hope I'm not bothering you. Do I need to call you back? If you come off like that, they ain't gonna do nothing for you. You got to come on like, look, I will destroy your reputation if my son get expelled. <laughs> and it works. Stay with me, y'all. Stay with me. Education is a what? Federal interest, state right, local function. Federal interest, state right, local function. What do I mean when I say education is a federal interest, state right, local function? Your children don't have a constitutional right to get an education. The United States Constitution doesn't deal with education. That's why the next 20 years, the United States Department of Education, which was opened in, what, 1980? It's going to be gone. They're getting rid of that. They said, we're spending too much money on poor children of color. We're getting rid of this. You ain't got no federal, ain't no constitutional right to learn. The state of Virginia gives you the right to learn. It is a state right and it is a local function, okay? Which means that if you have a problem with school, who are the people you should be talking to? Your state rep, your state senator. But how many of y'all called them up to complain about the school? I bet you nobody in here has ever had a conversation with their state rep or state senator about things you don't like in a local school board, local school district. I bet you you have. We let them just get away with doing nothing. You call Obama up, but Obama don't control the schools. 
Obama only controls those aspects of education that are federally funded. Which are what? What are the federally funded programs? JROTC, Special Ed, No Child Left Behind, Title I, Reach for America. Those are federal, so Obama can make you do what he wants you to do for those programs. Because he paying for them. But he don't control nothing else. That's the state. What y'all need to do is y'all need to build a Newport News independent black parent district, expels the child from the district. They still have the responsibility of making sure he receives his education. The alternative school was their way of making sure he received his education without having to spend any extra money. In other words, they finance the alternative school or run the alternative school or have a contract with the directors of the alternative school. It's in grants. And stuff. Exactly. So basically, by putting him in the alternative school, they were able to guarantee that he continued to receive his education. Not within their schools, but within an alternative school that they were operating or was being operated and financed by. Them. Would it be as a people possibly could do? Do we create our own alternative school? That would be a powerful idea. Mm, yes, we could. Okay. We could create our own alternative school. That's right. And you could get the funding from the school district mm. and say, look, guess what? When any black male is expelled from Newport News, Hampton, Norfolk, Virginia Beach, Lynchburg School District, they come to us for their 365 days. Mm. And we will teach them and send them back. Now what's going to be the difficulty? It may not be a difficulty, but could be. You have, your, your, your proposal for your alternative school has to be granted or accepted or condoned or approved by the school district. Mm. The school board has to say, we're going to grant approval to this particular proposal for this particular alternative school, okay, to send our children to. Because an alternative school is a multi-billion dollar, excuse me, multi-million dollar institution. You follow what I'm saying? So they may have difficulty granting you or I a proposal and contract for an alternative school when you got a white contractor who wants that money who can't do what you can do, but because he's part of the gang, they deny you and give it to him. Now, how about you saying you open up your own school? Yes, independent school. Man, once they get started, say a brother like me knock on your door and say, I want to start my own school. Would that be the way, or should we just go strictly private with this unit? Well, I personally like the independent school. Right. But I don't see anything wrong with having a private school and an alternative school. The alternative school can be ran by, we'll keep them separate, yeah. but the alternative school will be run by the public school's dollars, okay. right? To take care of kids in the public school whose parents can't afford to send them to the private school, but at least we can give them that 365-day corrective education. Right, right. So run an alternative school, keep it private, but then also have the independent school that's separate. Right. So even if we shut down the alternative school once the school district cancels the contract, we still have our own private school. Right, right. Don't make them one because once you make them one, you're now dependent on the school district's money to operate. You don't want that. Gotcha. Right. You want to keep your institutions private. Independent funding. Exactly, independent funding. But you can have that alternative school over there that's getting money from the district where we can educate children who are expelled from the district temporarily until they're able to go back. So you can have both a private and then a public alternative school. Mm, now, something else you mentioned, uh, I'll make sure I heard you correctly. You were saying the only people that have the power to suspend and kick your child out of school is the, the local school board. So what is this thing going on with the teachers giving that children three days, five days? Teachers, no, no. Oh, the principal, I mean. No, principal can give a suspension up to 10 days. Oh, okay, he do have a He cannot do 11 or more. Mm, you follow me? Gotcha. He cannot do 11 or more. If the child is in special ed, he can't do more than 10, period, for the whole, day, for the whole school year. See, I can suspend your kid for 10, suspend him for another 10, suspend him for another 10. As long that I never do 11 or more, I'm legal because he's a regular ed kid. If he's a special ed kid, once I hit 10, that's it. Special ed kids can only be suspended for 10 days, period. Now, hold on now. You said a special ed kid can only be uh, suspended for 10 days, period. Is these special ed kids are the same, considered the ones with the age, D, and all these other Yes, they have an IEP. So if they don't already have an IEP, and they still get suspended. Past 10 days, that's, a, uh, that's illegal, it's a violation, and the parents can sue the school district and force them to uh, pay compensatory education damages, which is when an account is created for your child, right? 
and you get to spend the money in the account on any academic service that your child needs. Tutoring, summer camp, any of that. Compensatory ed is money that the school district owes the family for failure to teach a special ed child. Mm -hmm. You can also sue the school district. once you get laid with that. Yes. You're taking adrenaline and all that other yes. crazy medicine. Right. Well, not necessarily the drugs, because the drugs don't fall into special ed. But the, but the learning problems, the retardation, ADHD, can fall under special ed. Okay, it's not automatically a special ed label, but it can qualify you for special ed as a child with an other health impairment. Okay. See, but once you have any of those deaf, blind, learning, disabled, mental retardation, emotional, any label, you have an IEP, okay? If that parent of that special ed child can prove that the district has failed to teach them, they can demand compensatory ed money, back pay, really, this is money that the school district has been getting for your kids since they've been in special ed. They have not been using it on your child. So now it's going to be set aside for you to be able to pay for different services. Mm, right? And that family. Exactly. That's just and then good. you can also force the local school district to pay for your child to go to an approved private school. Mm. You get both. Comp ed for failure to teach in the past. Approved private school going forward. Right. So let's say your kid is in the 10th grade. They've been in special ed since the 7th. Right. The child still can't read. Third, seventh grade to tenth grade, three years of comp ed. Tenth grade to twelfth grade, private school. So you gonna get private education for two years and a comp ed package for the past. You know, the thing I learned uh, in uh, I'm a the city, it might be going on every place else. Around um, elementary, they they kind of watching you, so to speak. But when, I feel when you get middle school, eleven or twelve, that's when they start finding ones to start labeling and saying. Because they don't want to be bothered. The whole thing is, that, is about the like Yes, it is. They track the kids. Basically, by the fifth grade, the school district has decided whether you're going to be a failure or whether you're going to be a success. So I wasn't tripping, then. No, sir. <laughs> okay. That's why you go into any school, they still track kids. Seven, one, seven, two, and seven, three. Mm. Seven, one are the bright kids who expected to go to college and the good high schools. Seven, two, the so-so kids, they average, they might go to trade school. Seven, three is the kids who expected to drop out and go to jail. Mm. And they already got that kind of quota. Uh, right. It ain't written. Mm. Uh -huh. But it exists in the collective consciousness of the educators in that school. Gotcha. In other words, you're not going to find no paper that says your child is on the, on the, on, on, on the, uh, the list for jail and dropout. It ain't on paper, but it's understood in the minds of the educators of that school. Through the, I guess, the uh, <laughs> rules of how to detect these things and so forth. Well, they're not rules, they're more like customs. Mm. Because it's not legal. You can't legally track children. You cannot legally say this kid is going to go to college and this one not. We're going to teach this kid, but we're not going to teach this kid. That's illegal. So you can't, you don't, there's no rule to protect it. But we have customs. Culture, school culture. The way we do things in this building, irrespective of what the law says. For example, every public school in America has a white teacher mafia. A white teacher mafia is a group of teachers, three to five white teachers who basically control the school. <laughs> They've been teaching for 20 years, the principal's scared of them, the other teachers are scared of them. You follow what I'm saying? Right, right, I don't feel it. And they decide where the kids go. They decide who go on to special ed. They decide who get kicked out. They even decide who work in that building. That's how powerful they are. Is there any law that says that they can be a teacher mafia? No. But that's the school culture in that building. Right, follow right, what I'm saying? Right, right, yes, sir. Mm. Well, you're going to shoot my brain up again because there's a lot of that going on in the community. Yes, yes, yes. Lynchburg, yes. definitely. Uh, mm, what else could we talk about right quick? I guess we got to get it ready to wrap it up. I know your vocal no cords no tired and hurting. You've been speaking all day. <laughs> definitely. Well, you heard it right here on uh, Street Height Family. This brother don't gave y'all some education. Y'all definitely got to get the book That's right here. Indeed. Get the book, Psychoacademic Holocaust, the Special Education and ADHD Wars against black boys. You can order this on my website, drumarjohnson.com, D-R-U-M-A-R-J-O-H-N-S-O-N. This is a must read book for all parents raising black boys. You must read this book to learn how special education, ADHD, and psychiatric medication are being used to oppress our young men. And also, more importantly, how you can deal with the attempts of the school and the psychologists to label, marginalize, and dope your child up. Mm -hmm. All that information is in this book, DrUmarJohnson.com. Check them out, family. Don't sleep. You know what I'm saying? Right here on the street height. Appreciate that. Yes, sir. Yes, and we're going to try to get this brother more in Virginia because yes, there's a lot of us being lynched still. You yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs>